Hi everyone, it's me, Tim. Today I want to talk about something that for a lack of a better phrase, I'm going to call game development caution. Before I start, I'm going to tell you three different stories. They're a little different, but then I'll tell you what I'm thinking about. Already off to a great start here with the anecdotal evidence. We like to see that. Back when we made Fallout, towards the end, when we were really trying to get it out, we had two whiteboards. One whiteboard had a list of features or content that weren't done yet that really needed to get in. And the other whiteboard had a list of what the 10 most <clears throat> egregious bugs were. And next to each person, next to each one of these on these two different whiteboards were listed the person who was assigned to it. We did it in a whiteboard like this so that people could come in the morning and look at it because this predated Jira or Confluence or anything like that. They could come in, look at the whiteboard and go, oh, I see something I need to jump on. Worked fine. I don't think I heard any complaint about it. People liked getting stuff off of that. If they saw something, I was like, I'm on that today. Try doing the exact same thing 10 years later at Carbine. Overwhelmingly, people said, no, do not do that. I will quit if you do that. <laughs> if I see my name on that whiteboard, I will quit. And I said, well, what if we don't put people's names next to it? I'll still quit. People will know it's me. Story two. What's so funny about this is maybe we'll see what he ends up saying later, but maybe the move he should have gone with was letting the people who threatened to quit over being associated with the work they're doing quit, thereby potentially resulting in a more productive team. But we'll see. Two. When we were making The Outer Worlds, <clears throat> I wanted to put in, this is probably year end of year two, so we're still a year away. The combat AI wasn't really in yet, so I asked for a very simple combat aggression code to be added. It was, this is how simple it was. Every time an NPC got shot, they would see if that person was on the list of someone who'd shot them. If they weren't, they'd add them to the list which the amount of, with the amount of damage they just took. If they were already on the list, they'd just add the amount of damage they took. Whenever they're deciding who to attack, they attack the person at the top of the list. That's it. That's all I wanted. Keep in mind, the advantage of that basic AI, you can make lots of changes later. You can make them that it has the, the one at the top of the list, if it's different than the person you're attacking, the damage has to exceed the damage of, of the person attacking you by a certain amount before you're changed targets. You can take distance into account. You can take whether you can reach them into account, whether you have a ranged weapon. Into well, and the biggest advantage here is that it's you implemented the simplest thing to solve the problem. And that almost always is going to have all these nice branch off points where you can add complexity if it's needed. Account. All that comes later. That's all I wanted. Uh, it got put into the programmer production query queue and came back with uh, an estimate of four weeks. <laughs> I pushed back saying the code I asked for was very simple. I've written it before. Would take about 45 minutes. It's basically there's already a callback when you get hit. That's when you look to put them on the list. And there's a callback. There's a, a call when you want to pick a target. That's when you look at the list and see which one you want to attack. That's it. The programmer who it got signed to came to me and said, I need four weeks. And I'm like, why? Walk me through what you're going to do. And he goes, you don't understand. And I was like, I've coded this three times. Walk me through it. And he wouldn't. He left. He left angry. Lead programmer came back, started yelling at me, saying, if he says he needs four weeks, he needs four weeks. And I'm like, then I will do it. I'll have it done before lunch. And he said, no, because no one. then people will have to support your code. I'm like... There, there is no supporting code that was written in 40 minutes. 
Because if it could be written in 40 minutes, you could just rewrite it in 40 minutes. There's no supporting this code. Also, arguably, at least my opinion would be that the guy who took four weeks to make something versus the guy who took 40 minutes, the guy who took 40 minutes, I would argue that his would be much more maintainable because I can only begin to imagine the disaster that I expect would occur if somebody spent four weeks on something this basic. Well, let me walk through, I'm going to walk you through what I want. And you tell me why this takes four weeks. He looked at what I wrote, which was about 10 lines of pseudocode on a whiteboard. And he goes, I'll come back. He came back about an hour later and said, what about two weeks? And I said, do I have any options here? Fine. Two weeks. Story three. I, I wonder, my, you know, so a, a lot of people know that AAA game studios have struggle with um, being profitable these days. Or may, many of the games they make don't make that much money. And I don't think it has to do, I don't think the problem fundamentally is that there's a shrinking game market or that they're not selling enough. My theory is that they spend too much money on the games. This being just an example on it. If you are employing hordes and hordes of programmers to get almost nothing done, then of course you're going to blow through your budget and then you're not going to make any games. But it seems maybe it's probably psychologically way easier to try to become profitable by adding more microtransactions into the game, trying to get more revenue, as opposed to looking at your own team and saying, most of these people need to go. Because if he's experiencing this, then I don't think this is a one-off case, right? If it's one employee on the team wanted four weeks, but then the lead programmer is defending the four weeks, then that's emblematic of an entire team that just is so incapable that they can't get this done in a reasonable amount of time. That just means, and if that's a common thing, then you're going to you're going to be spending a tremendous amount of money to get anything done. Leonard and I talk about features all the time, whether it's dialogues or system mechanics or story setting. We get very into it. Our voices may be raised. We're jumping out of our chairs to draw things on whiteboards. We're pacing back and forth. I know I've mentioned this before, but Anthony Davis showed up at our door and said, you, you guys have to stop yelling. Everybody's getting nervous. It's like mom and dad are yelling at each other. <laughs> Still don't know who he meant was mom, but we explained that's just us talking. We're not mad, but we're trying to tease apart exactly what to do and we're getting into it so what do those three stories have to do with each other i'm starting to see in the industry i shouldn't say starting in the last decade the last quarter of my career i'm starting to see this rise of what i can only call development caution an abundance of caution uh, of padding estimates, uh, time estimates of wanting to go around and check with a lot of people to see if something's okay, asking, should we do this? I'm not sure. Let's have a meeting. Frequently, people would want to have a meeting to discuss something, and those were the very people who would say, we have too many meetings. I can't get any work done. Now, caution can be a really good thing if it leads to less bugs, less stress. Also, I get the fact that because games cost more now, your people are approaching it with this sense of caution because... Well, and inherent in running a big AAA studio is because you have such a big budget, you have to take less risks with the budget. But if this spirit of caution leads you to... Because the reason to be cautious is to not waste money 
on experimental game design or something. But if your caution leads you to spend a tremendous amount of money because just nobody, all your employees can't do anything, then it it seems counterproductive. You're not just going to be out a little bit of money. You're going to be out a lot of money if this game doesn't do well. The thing that worries me, though, is games can also be a lot worse because of caution. And everybody who's cautious kind of denies that. They're like, no, it'll... We're reducing bugs. We're incre increasing life work balance. People are less stressed. And I'm like, true. But with l but you're also taking a lot less risk in a game. Also, if people are getting paid more and there's more work-life balance, which I interpret that statement as meaning less work and more non-work life, then what you're saying is, no, it's good because we're getting paid to work less. But if you get paid to work less, that seems like the most obvious thing that's going to reduce the profitability on the game. Unless maybe you're in the modern uh, like BS Jobs cult where you think that working less makes you more productive. You know, some people some people will say that you're more productive at, you know, four hours or six hours per day than 10 hours per day, when that's obviously not true uh, at all. You really have to stretch your brain to, to believe that, but yet people will say it. And um, well, there's no way that's not good. Not good. That's, there's no way that's gonna make your studio more profitable if people work less, but get paid the same um but per perhaps there's some psychological program where people are arguing they adopt the stance of denial because then they get i mean it's in their self-interest short-term self-interest not in, in the interest of the studio but in their short-term interest to be working less but still make the same amount of money but it, it then it kind of feels like it it starts to turn a little bit into looting, but which in many games I think give them less charm, and yeah, even games that have jank have a lot of charm. My games have had jank. Uh, I know people talk about jank in other games. You know things where the AI, AI acts in a bizarre way in certain circumstances, or NPCs say weird things or do weird things. It can be charming, but. Things have changed, and I know games have gone from being an expression of an idea of an of like artwork from a particular person or group of people into a corporate-driven, money-seeking instrument. And I get it. There's a lot of money going into these. In a way, though, I would argue they always were. You always were making these with the idea that, you know, I hope it sells a lot and we make money, but now designs are being driven by this. That's why we have microtransactions. It's why we have pre-orders. It's why we have what we're starting to see lately where games are, if you pay a little more, you can play it a few days or even a week early. Now, you can't always get blame the, the publishers or the developers for this. If people didn't pay for it, they wouldn't do it. It's like spam. If everybody stopped an answering spam tomorrow, it would go away. But because a tiny percentage does, it's there for everybody to see. But so I'm not really talking about the money driven part. I'm talking about how the caution is dampening down the ideas. It's why I'm going to double down on this. I've always thought the indie space is a lot richer in ideas. Probably not money. Certainly not money. But they're much richer in ideas because they take less. Uh, they take they have less caution and take a lot more risk. And unfortunately, what I see then is um, triple A's that dip into indie games for features and ideas. By the way, it's not just publishers and developers that I see all this caution with. I've seen a huge rise in caution in game journalism. It's become the norm that no one want, no journalist wants to risk getting into an embargo situation where they're not given a an early access code so they can't write their reviews earlier than other people. They're 
I don't think I have ever read this will probably date me, but I don't think I've ever read a review by a game journalist. Ever. Because if I buy if I buy games is either because I saw the material firsthand from the developer, thought it was cool, or I saw some YouTube content from somebody else about it and I thought it looked cool. Or I have friends tell me about something, and that's how it comes into my awareness. I've, but I don't think I've ever. Yes, the concept of a game journalist is not really registering in my mind, even though, of course, that sounds like something that would exist. They're worried about not being invited to press events or, you know, junkets, I think they're called. So a lot of them have gone a lot more cautious in what they say. I really miss the reviews. I'll name a couple like Scorpia in the 80s and 90s and Deslock in the 90s and early 2000s. Because those two people, those two reviewers said what they thought. If you put out a game, they skewer you for all the things that were wrong with it. Also, you know, if what, you know, I'm trying to imagine now why I would... Uh, read a game journalist but um, certainly the, the reasons to read a game journalist goes to zero if they're not saying anything you know because if they're just if their job is just regurgitating information from a press release I would much rather just read the press release I guess maybe what you could call game journalism is for Kerbal Space Program 2 I consumed a lot of content from KSP content creators who were covering new stuff and updates, etc. Maybe that could be game journalism, but I don't think that's the people he's talking about now. But then they praise you for everything that's right with it. Now it's sort of like, well, we really like this, but they don't want to like really double down on it because it may be something people don't like. So like, let's say a journalist loves the diversity in a game. He may go, well, I'm not going to say that that much because I don't want to come across as being pandering and also some people yell when you talk about that. So I just see a lot of the passion drain out of game journalism. And they're really just trying to go for what can what kind of review can I write that generates the most clicks? And I guess this worries me because if I see this everywhere, if I see this in publishers and developers and now new people entering the industry, they, they don't have this passion anymore. So you know, what's the moral of all this? I, I, I want to tell people, just go and make it. Make what you want. You don't need a committee to sign off on it. You can always go back and change it. Or if you make something and it turns out not to be good at all and unsalvageable, throw it away. But that that rapid iteration to get to some really good idea is a lot better than just being so cautious that you basically creep up to a very mundane... It seems what he's talking about, without really saying it... Is I, in my language or my understanding of the world, this would be your game studio has turned into a bureaucracy, or like a design by committee thing. Right, same thing. Lots of people, nobody, no single person is ever in charge to make decisions, and um, then. Uh, you just get this sort of average soup game that doesn't show any kind of passion in its development. People can tell. People can tell. So I started with stories. Let me end with those three stories and how they kind of got resolved. So I didn't even try to do the whiteboard solution when I made Outer Worlds. What I did is I made my own confluence page called like I was Tim Kane's top 10 or something it was in my confluence space and I wrote here are the 10 biggest things I want looked at this week and there were a few producers who would look at that page all the time what was great about this solution nobody could come and complain to me about it because it was in my confluence space my own personal but public confluence space also, I'd like to point out that anybody could go to JIRA at any time 
and say, what are the 10 most high prior, highly prioritized bugs and who are they assigned to? So we already had that whiteboard virtually, but somehow it was okay that it wasn't called attention to. For the combat aggression code, I think I settled on two weeks and I think it got done faster than that. Great, I got it. I don't think I asked for anything after that. I didn't go and specifically ask for anything because I realized that I was being viewed as some sort of ogre <laughs> when I knew something could be done faster and there was no solution to it, which is why years ago I started thinking, ooh, this is becoming a problem. Same thing with Leonard and I yelling at each other. We just kept doing it. We're like, it's our office. We're shut the door. We're not mad at each other. But this is the way we get things done. Note, noted that people don't. some people don't like it. We won't get things done like that with you. And let me tell you, I think there were people who felt like they missed out on not being parts of those conversations. Some people would come over. Uh, Charlie um, had his office right next door. And he would, the lead designer on on Outer Worlds, and he would come in sometimes and join in. Great. Other people didn't do that, you missed out. And I think you missed out on some really fun, active, engaging conversations about game development. But that's the way things are going. So I'm not sure I have a great solution other than telling people, reminding people to be passionate, but I just kind of want to talk about this because it kind of ties into bigger teams and longer development time and bigger budgets, just this whole game development caution that's rising up in the industry. So there, whew, got that off my chest. Oh, we can't get added. Um, yeah, I'd say I mostly agree with that, although I don't think his, um, I don't think his conclusions were nearly as far reaching as they need to be. Um, but hey, I mean, I don't work in games, so it's not really my business, even though I have opinions about it. What I do is I make this operating system from scratch, which you can read more about at samhsmith.com slash serenum. You know, he said that it would take four weeks to have an array and add some stuff into the array. Well, it took me about five weeks to make a window manager from scratch that looks like this. Um, so that's pretty cool. If if you think this looks interesting, you should check it out. Uh, and uh, otherwise, I will see you in the next video.